So, uh, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, liver support, I guess in some ways is what we're all looking for, so that those patients who don't clearly need liver transplant because they're never going to regenerate adequately might be supported through to survival. It's that cohort of patients. This is obviously the sort of patient we're talking about in that regard, someone with profound multiple organ failure, hemodynamic instability, cerebral failure, renal failure, as well as their liver failure. So as you've heard, the issues that we've got to deal with are the development of multiple organ failure and the role of supportive intensive care therapy as well as specifics, and the fact that these patients will either die, recover, or need transplantation. And we need to see whether we can move some of these deaths to recoveries with liver support and or avoid transplantation, or at least that is the aim. There are various systems that we might use, plasma exchange, adsorptive systems, dialysis systems, that may all offer us the opportunity to remove some of these putative mediators, which we believe are all toxic and limit liver regeneration. So the available systems we've got, we can use dialysis systems. And I think it's important to consider that renal replacement therapy in its own right does have a role. So ammonia is a water-soluble mediator, and therefore by offering early appropriate renal replacement therapy, we actually mitigate that hyperammonemia and decrease your risk of cerebral edema. And that might well be one of the reasons that we are now seeing a steady but inexorable decrease in severe intracranial hypertension. We then have the systems offering albumin dialysis, the adsorption systems, and plasma exchange, and I'll talk about those this morning. There are biological systems. By and large, there is little data for true acute liver failure using the biological systems, be they hepatoblastoma cells or pig hepatocytes. Liver perfusion back in the 70s and 80s was the thing to do. You took a liver that couldn't be transplanted or a porcine liver and used total perfusion to try and support the patient. Interestingly, with some of the genetic manipulation in porcine livers, that might come around the block again. And of course, we've already heard about auxiliary transplant, which in its own way is a liver support system, albeit perhaps over a year. So, what are the confounders when we need to look at the evidence for liver support being beneficial? Because let's be honest, all of us like to find a piece of kit in a cupboard, wheel it out to a patient with all the bells and whistles, and to assume that we are making benefit. Just reeling out a piece of equipment doesn't necessarily mean we are doing benefit. We need to look at it. And I like this data from Ludwig Kramer in Vienna, a small number of patients, and it's acute on chronic liver failure. But if we're using bilirubin as a marker of efficacy, which many of these systems do, just giving some fluid results in a significant decrease in your bilirubin. So let's just be cautious about what we look at. Some of the older studies and what we need to learn from history. A whole series of case series from Alex Jimson back in the late 70s and 80s looking at charcoal hemoperfusion. Really is archaic kit in this day and age. But all of it was positive. Fantastic. When we did the randomized control trials, they were negative. Bioartificial liver assist devices, the work of Dimitriou et al., the case theories were really powerfully positive, both in terms of cardiovascular benefit and in terms of neurological benefit. And that was really charcoal hemoperfusion and porcine hepatocytes. When it went out to a big multicenter study, that effect was lost. Now, I don't think we know whether it truly wasn't efficacious or whether when you've got multiple centers who do things all slightly differently in a very rare disease, whether you can really expect a machine to make things clearly better. So maybe we said no when in fact there is still potential benefit. The liver assist devices, similarly, some initial studies show biochemical improvement, but really big studies haven't been forthcoming. And that's again where you've got confluence of hepatoblastoma cells um, growing around a filter through which you put plasma. 
This is the liver assist device. Um, it's a complex system. It's plasma separation, then running your plasma over your hepatocytes. Your hepatocytes are maintained with an oxygenator and a glucose system. It requires a bit like ECMO. You need a nurse to run the ELAD system. You need a nurse to look after the patient. It's a complex system. And again, we don't yet have the big multi-center studies to suggest, or even the single-center studies to suggest efficacy. So there is an abstract for acute hepatitis B out of China showing transplant-free survival. So the full mass study looking at Mars and albumin dialysis. Excellent study, good number of patients, a mixture of etiologies, acute, hyperacute, significant amount of acetaminophen. Standard medical therapy versus standard medical therapy from, with Mars. Good number of patients transplanted, so a sick cohort of patients. We've got the right patients in this group. There is a suggestion, but it didn't hit significance, that the Mars might have been slightly better. But as you see here, the overall probability of survival did not hit significant benefit. The cumulative probability of getting to transplantation, however, was significantly improved by receiving Mars therapy. But what I would draw your attention to particularly is the median time from wait list to transplantation and therefore enrollment into the study was only 16 hours. So most patients only got one treatment episode. So can you really expect a system, a machine system, to show benefit when you then go on to transplant people? And again, so I don't think this should necessarily be viewed as a negative study, but the complexity of doing studies in acute liver failure in this context. On the multivariate analysis, the things that particularly came out as pertaining to six-month survival was etiology, acetaminophen. By and large, these patients don't need transplantation and get better, and lactate level. A suggestion here that coagulation was approaching significance, but not quite getting there. So I now want to move on to plasma exchange. The historical data back in the early 2000s, uh, a study in children showing very clear improvement of coagulation parameters, both for your pro and your anticoagulant factors when you use plasma exchange. Now that actually might be pertinent because if you look at explanted livers, they are stuffed full of microthrombi. So actually by improving the Procoagulant factors, the protein C, the protein S, the AT3, by using plasma exchange, you might actually mitigate liver damage. And that's something I think that we need to consider in the future. Again, another study showing benefit more recently in children. And then this study looking at pigs with acute liver failure, with all of the concerns about pigs to humans. This was from Rajiv Jalan's group, showing that there was a suggestion that plasma adsorption, low-dose plasma exchange, and a plasma adsorption uh, liver support system might show significant improvement versus controls. But as I say, pigs and can't be yet translated. So if you look at the evidence base, over 300 patients reported, this was back in 2010. Randomized controlled trial zero, controlled trial zero, all case series and case reports, and all that we could come up with was grade two, weak or moderate quality of evidence. The plasma exchange story really comes out of Copenhagen in terms of the case series. An improvement in encephalopathy, an improvement in cerebral perfusion pressure and cerebral blood flow, an improvement in hemodynamic variables, and an improved removal of ammonia, perhaps suggesting an effect on hepatic function. And obviously, you have all of these uh, disadvantages that you're removing other water-soluble substances less effectively, and you've also got an unselective removal of things that might be beneficial. So it took us an awful long time it was Helsinki, Copenhagen, and Kings undertook uh, a multi-center study. It took us 12 years to enroll this number of patients, and therefore you could argue that treatment changed over time. We did actually look at that when we analyzed the data. It was a very pragmatic study. One and a half liters of plasma exchanged. Fresh frozen plasma was the total replacement fluid, and it was about 15% of body weight. 
I should say that we have subsequently decreased that and are still seeing the same effects. So we now give between about four and six litres as per standard plasma exchange protocols. It took us 11 years to do the study. These are the patients as you see them. They are an appropriate age for acute liver failure, much younger than a general ITU population, and thus they've got good physiology on their side. Hyperacute with a predominant group. The etiology uh, showed a significant amount of uh, acetaminophen. The majority of these patients were in grade three, four encephalopathy, and hence 60% of them were ventilated, 70%, uh, sorry, and 86%. Significant number on vasopressors, 60% and 51%. Oliguric, suspected infection, similarly matched across the two. Slightly higher fever in the uh, high volume group, but none of that statistically significantly different. I just draw your attention to ICP in those that had it measured, 14% in both groups. So again, no difference. And as I alluded to, high instance of vasopressors, uh, mechanically ventilated, and renal replacement therapy. So what did the data show? Well, overall, liver transplant centered censored survival, you see a benefit for those patients who received high volume plasma exchange. If you then go on and look at it in more detail, for those patients that went on to transplantation, there was no significant benefit of plasma exchange. So if you're going to, a bit like the Mars study, if you're going to get transplanted quickly, you don't show a benefit of a supportive technique. If, however, you weren't going on to get transplanted, there was a clear benefit for plasma exchange, which was highly statistically significant. So then moving on into subgroup analysis. This was a group of patients who fulfilled transplant criteria, but for various reasons we did not list as the three centers. So they were either too unwell physiologically, they had too much comorbidity, or psychiatric co com, uh, contraindications to transplantation. And for this group, I think importantly also, there was a significant benefit for plasma exchange. If you were listed but not transplanted, there was a trend, but it did not hit significance for plasma exchange. Some of the reasons for not being transplanted were the team thought you were getting better anyway. In terms of serious adverse events, I'm sorry, that's gone wrong, standard medical therapy and high volume plasma exchange, there was no difference between the two. We had been worried about sepsis. We'd been worried about pancreatitis. None of these hit significance. You see those there. What was also interesting was the immunological effects, and I don't expect people to really look at or read this slide, but what was clear was that plasma exchange removed damps, and that was significant. And what we also saw was an improvement in monocyte function. So again, along with the perhaps avoidance of the prothrombotic effect within your liver, an improvement in your immunology, it begins to tell a story as to why plasma exchange might be useful in liver failure when you've got large amounts of necrotic tissue being released into the circulation and further damage to the liver in terms of microthrombosis. So in terms of liver support, have we got whoops, to this highly elegant bridge yet? No. Are we a bit better than this rickety bridge? Yeah, I think we are making progress. But I think as with all clinical trials in highly complex environments, perhaps the way for us as intensivists to get the information we need is to not do very big multi-center studies, but quite focused multi-center studies where the centers doing it have very similar practice and you can standardize management and really try and look at the effect. So thank you for your attention.